Hey guys, my name is Alex, and this is another episode of Poor Lighting. It is also the proper 24th installment in my video project series thing, Kingly Endeavors, in which I intend to read all of Stephen King's novels in loose, comfortable uh, chronological order. But I'm jumping a few volumes because following a very long hiatus in which I worked on a bunch of other things that were very demanding and all-consuming, I decided not only to jump back into the sort of collected universe of Stephen King's work, but more concertedly to jump back into a segment of his work that I knew would like consume me more than any other segment of his work. But also, it's the segment that I've kind of been neglecting and the one by which I'm still kind of intimidated. The last three volumes of his Dark Tower series, which began in, I think, 1977. Following a very long hiatus between book four, Wizard and Glass, and book five, Wolves of the Kala, Stephen King had famously a near-death experience in 1999. He was going for a walk on uh, the side of a road near his house when a sort of distracted driver hit him at a very high speed with a van. King was like horribly fucked up. As I've mentioned uh, in other videos, his leg was so severely broken. His doctor wanted to amputate it. Stephen King said, hey, don't amputate it. And then the doctor said, the bones in your leg are like marbles in a sock. So he had a long, painful road to recovery. And in the midst of that long, painful road to recovery, he kind of relapsed in the sobriety that had shaped so much of his work from the 1990s. In particular, he fell into a rut with, uh, understandably, pain management medication. And while he was really fucked up on opioids, he wrote uh, the entirety of that 800-something page uh, uh, ter novel, Dreamcatcher, which I read early on in high school. And I remember thinking, yes, this does feel like medicine. So coming out of the slump of working on this very long project and wanting a palate cleanser, I decided not to jump back into a book that I n I'm pretty certain I'm not going to enjoy. Let me just jump into book five. And in the same way that Stephen King released these last three volumes in very quick succession, because in light of that near-death experience, he was like, I fucking hooked a lot of people with this series. I better do them the service of finishing it. So I'm gonna do myself, maybe, the service of finishing it, plowing through the last three volumes, which amounts to about 2,500 pages. And as a proof of commitment, I did already do that. I read the last three volumes in quick succession over the course of like 10 days, and it was intense. But the reason I did that is because I'm like incredibly nervous that someone is going to spoil anything about book seven for me, which, as we are about to discuss, is exactly the kind of thinking that Stephen King is trying to discourage with this whole series. Getting into it right away, basically, this novel is a retelling of Seven Samurai or The Magnificent Seven. There is a small, humble, rural community that is beset by marauding entities. That's the frame of all these stories. But in this case, they are the entities that come and, and fuck with this village are called the Wolves, capital W. Not because they are actual wolves, but they are uh, entities with uh, laser swords that might sound familiar. And they wear these metal masks that make them look something like Doctor Doom, and they attack the village and they kidnap, I think, one half of every set of twins. And then they take these kids somewhere and I think they come back and they grow up to be like giants and they've got all kinds of cognitive impairments and I think they die in their 30s. Which sounds like a good story in the same way that Seven Samurai is a good story, Magnificent Seven is a good story. What it probably doesn't sound like is a 1,000 page story, which... It is, thanks Stephen. The reason that this book is about a thousand pages is because, kind of like book four, it's a sandwich and there's 40 pages or 50 pages in the beginning about a journey and then another 50 pages at the end about the end of that journey and the 700 pages in the middle is like a New York deli orgy. It's a whole different novel crammed into, it's a big Western digression. It's kind of like the second half of the first uh, Sherlock Holmes novel. Sherlock Holmes is investigating a murder and then he handcuffs a random dude and he's like, you're the fucking killer. I know. That's actually what he says. I was very surprised. You're the fucking killer. I know it. And I, I want you to tell me a story about uh, why you did it. And then the dude, the fucking killer, tells this like hundred page story about cowboys. And Arthur Conan Doyle <laughs> takes us the whole way. Incidentally, that factors into this book. A couple of the characters pick up a copy of the first four slim novels of Sherlock Holmes, which is uh, significant because the number four plays into this in the same way that the number three and 19 and 1999 and number nine. I really get exhausted with books that try to employ numerology. For some reason, I like when Daniel Mark Danielewski does it in his series, The Familiar. But anyways, the reason it's a thousand pages is because you get that like decent meaty frame story in the present moment, 
but it is just a frame in which other characters will step on stage whence Stephen King gives them like 40 or 50 pages to tell their fucking story and the stories invariably are good and they're worth the digression that they take you on. It's just frustrating when you're looking for closure on that frame narrative, and then here comes, oh, hold on guys, let me continue my tale. And you just know that you're about to digress from the main storyline for 40 pages, and they might be a wonderful, riveting 40 pages, but that recurring thing, that sh what feels like a structural tick, it is actually, I maintain, a pretty integral part to the theme of the Dark Tower series. What these anecdotes are that pepper the story and sort of illuminate the larger framework of the series is they are digressions, but they are often beautiful, funny, inventive, violent, striking, stimulating digressions. And in order to explain what I think Stephen King is doing there, I will invoke the fact that all throughout this series, characters are constantly saying, Here's what we need to do, and I think we should do it because my gut tells me we need to do it. And that's not to suggest that the, it's narrative shoddiness, that it's the author shooting from the hip in the same way that the characters are. What it speaks to is something that, at this point, the early 2000s, late 1990s, the author Ray Bradbury would mention very charismatically in a number of like public talks that he would give and essays that he would publish. He comes up quite a bit in this latter part of the series, and what he was a huge advocate of when it came to writing and when he was sort of giving instruction to young prospective storytellers is that it is a kind of magic that when you are telling a story you should be allow yourself to be guided by impulse by instinct just trust your gut don't outline don't scrutinize it don't edit as you go along do not intellectualize what is ultimately an artistic, emotional procedure. Now, you can say he felt that way about the writing of the work. Editing is something completely different. Editing is where you bring in, you know, structure and grammarians and uh, intent. But the Dark Tower series is ultimately about a few people going on a journey toward a specific destination. And the destination they are heading toward is a tower. The Dark Tower in the Dark Tower series is like a literal tangible thing. It is an architectural structure that they are heading toward. But I would argue that it is also a rhetorical structure. In other words, the people who are on this journey, our main characters, they think that they're going toward a location and a structure, when I think the author maintains that the real destination is the personal change that will ensue from having reached the tower. And what Wolves of the Kala kind of focuses on in a way that the previous volumes did not is that at the center of the Dark Tower there is a rose, and inside that rose are all the good deeds of humanity. And it is the rose, beginning in Wolves of the Kala, to which our journeymen are more focused. And Stephen King loves to trade in sort of colloquial cliches. And what is the most colloquial cliche that we know about roses? It is that in order to enjoy your life, you must stop and smell them. That is why, in the course of this overarching story about a bunch of people heading toward the Dark Tower, the narrative's most rewarding passages are when we pause and we look at a random other sideline digressive story which is emotionally rewarding and it helps to provide context about our other larger destination. What Stephen King is literally making the reader do when he stops the entire narrative in order to digress into another narrative and then 50 pages later brings us back to where we thought we wanted to go is he is literally forcing us to stop and smell the roses. My ultimate verdict is, uh, you know, did I like it? Yeah, I, uh, I really liked it. If you are not prepared and open-minded to long 40-page digressions in the middle of an otherwise very engaging story, you're gonna get really fucking annoyed whenever they come up. But once you acclimate to that structure, it, it would be hard to say that this is the best or in the top 10 of Stephen King's best books, but if you acclimate to its wiles, its weirdnesses, this is one of the better volumes of the Dark Tower series. Those are my thoughts on Wolves of the Kala. They will probably be fleshed out when I do my next video about Song of Susanna, which is volume six. And before we wrap up, another quick thing that I wanna mention, you can see from like two or three videos ago, I just quit my job at a restaurant. And yes, in order to make ends meet, I am scampering to another restaurant job, but I decided that now while working at another restaurant, restaurant, I may as well like take a stab at a sort of a small editing business. So if you have any need for some kind of editing service, and go ahead and send me an email at thousandmovieproject at gmail.com. I'll put a link down in the description. And yeah, just explain what you're looking for and let's see if we can 
make something happen. I'm excited to sort of take this into my hands and try to make something work. Anyways, more conversations about Stephen King to come tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.